I'm Christina McLaughlin, a managing editor at ACS Publications, and we're thrilled to have you join us today for our webinar featuring the latest in research on the biochemistry of pain, hosted by ACS Publications and the journal Biochemistry. So as we go along, please ask questions by using the Q&A chat function at the bottom of the screen at any time, and then each speaker will address questions at the end of their talk. Biochemistry Executive Editor, Professor Brian Roth from University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill has organized this event along with us, and I'd like to introduce him now to share some additional introductory comments. Greetings, everyone. I just wanna thank you all for attending this, uh, what, what should be a very exciting uh, webinar on pain and pain-related uh, uh, biochemistry. And the background, of course, is the, uh, at least in the US, the opioid epidemic, um, which even in the era of COVID is um, still decimating large swaths of, of America and certainly is a worldwide problem. And so there is urgent need for developing uh, non-addictive and safer analgesic agents. And without further ado, we'll start. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Abhi Mayon and, uh, from Mount Sinai, and he'll be discussing prioritizing pain-associated targets with machine learning. Go ahead, Abhi. Oh, and, and one question is, one thing is if you have a question, uh, just put it in the Q&A or the chat, and, and we'll get to it um, after everybody's presentation. Thank you. Bye. So thank you, Brian, and thank you all for attending today. I really appreciate the invitation to contribute to the special issue of biochemistry. Uh, I'm a professor at the Department of Pharmacological Sciences at Mount Sinai, and also the director of Center for Bioinformatics. Um, I need to see why I can't. Okay. So just a little bit of an overview about the challenge. And like Brian said, the opioid crisis is having um, a devastating effect on the U United States. Uh, there are about 100 million people that have uh, suffering from persistent pain. And this is a major cost for the US economy. And overall, we have a, a real challenge with identifying a additional novel a, therapeutics and targets. So far, all of the targets are either opioid um, agonist and as well as um, drugs that target the COX system. So identifying novel targets is a major challenge and an opportunity. So in this um, presentation, I'm gonna talk about a paper that was published in the special issue and we, in this paper, we use machine learning uh, to predict and prioritize uh, 17 different pain types. This project was led by Minji Jian and Kathleen Jagotnik, who are both uh, postdocs in the laboratory. So the first step of uh, you know, setting up the project was to uh, do research about pain and finding um, whether we can create a set of genes that are associated with pain. And quickly found that there are actually many pain subtypes. So Kathleen uh, went through the literature and found several uh, specific databases that list uh, genes that are associated with different pain types, as well as there are uh, many databases that are specific for ge general purpose associating genes and phenotypes or genes and diseases. So those are listed here. And overall, the criteria was to have at least 50 genes per pain type. And at the end, we settled on 17 pain types. So these are the 17 pain types and the number of genes that are associated with each of those pain types. And in this lecture, I'm going to focus on um, RA, but in general, um, we can uh, do the same analysis and uh, we can also focus on other pain types that are of interest and in the same way. So overall, we had uh, 7,620 7, gene, gene pain type association involving almost 6,000 genes. 
So in order to make those predictions, we have to set up some uh, features that are, uh, can be used, and those are supposed to be unbiased features that can be used to make those predictions. So to set that up, if we had three types of features, transcriptomics, proteomics, and gene ontology. And the transcriptomics uh, features were uh, created by uh, taking 10,000 randomly selected bulk RNA-seq samples that we process from GEO. We have this resource called Arches4 that contain about 750,000 samples uniformly processed. And we took all this data and then we create um, gene gene core expression matrix. And then we also did similar uh, process for uh, proteomics. We found two resources that did a mass spec proteomics to profile uh, different cells for two projects, the proteomics DB and CCLE. And we converted that data into approximately 8,000 protein, protein similarity matrix based on expression. And then we also use the gene ontology to create a gene-gene similarity uh, matrix based on shared Go terms. All of this data was uh, assembled into this neural network model that uh, was an ensemble model. The reason it says 18 pain types because we also tried to predict to build a model for um, a pain type that contains all of the pain types. And um, one of the things that we've done, we reduced the dimensionality of those matrices using principal component analysis and then use those PCs as the features for the machine learning. So overall, the model performed really well. And for some pain types, it performed better than others. And arthritis and rheumatoid arthritis were in the top three. And for neuropathic pain, the performance was not that good. One of the things that we want to see is like how much each of those resources, the transcriptomics, proteomics, and Go uh, terms contribute to the predictions. And uh, this is an ensemble model that used the features from all three. And you can see that the overall the ensemble model is better than each individual uh, modality of data. So uh, all of those features, they contribute. So having proteomics and transcriptomics and Go terms, all of those things together, they contribute to uh, an improved level of predictions. Another thing that uh, we tested is to see if this neural network approach is better than other top, sort of like based uh, level machine learning methods. So we tried SVM, linear regression, random forest, and K nearest neighbors. And uh, in general, overall, the neural network approach outperformed those other models. But in some cases, for some pain types, those other models were performed as well. So what those models are doing, they basically prioritize genes, all, all human genes that are in the lists of the, in those matrices for their possible association with each of those pain types. So you get a ranked list of genes and proteins based on those pain types. And you can see that uh, for some pain types, uh, there are um, different types of drug uh, target classes that are overrepresented. So for example, for migraine, we get a lot of ion channels and for RA, we get a lot of GPCRs. So this is the top 20 predicted uh, RA genes uh, across all genes. So we also label them whether they are from the IDG, collections of kinases, ion channels, and in GPCRs. And then you can see that the fifth one is a GPCR as a part of the IDG, but may, most of them are not IDG. And you can see that many of those top ranked uh, RA predicted genes have very few publications. So there are many of them are completely have no publication. So about five out of the um, top 20 have publications 
and very few of them are mentioned with rheumatoid arthritis. So um, the next few slides, I'm going to um, focus on CCL4, L2, which is a ligand that is a completely understudied. So there's seven publications that mentioned it and it was never mentioned with RA. We also have in the paper tables that just look at GPCRs, ion channels, and kinases. And this is the table for RA. And here you can see the CCRL2 that was fifth in the overall list. And in this particular lecture, I'm going to focus on the third one, GPR132, which is uh, only has uh, 30 publications and was never mentioned with RA. So now I have those two uh, genes that I'm interested in focusing on, and I want to try to find information about them. So in this uh, slide, I'm showing you a collection of databases that have gene landing pages. And those uh, databases, also, uh, they also are listed the uh, drug landing pages. So there are 33 gene landing pages resources and about 15 drug landing pages resources that we've been collecting. And then we've developed this website uh, recently where it's aggregating all of those resources as cards. So this is like cards of gene cards on cards of drug cards. And you can come here and put in the gene name or um, drug name and then receive a uh, cards that uh, list the different sources with a hyperlink to the gene landing page for that gene. For example, here it's GPR132. So one of those resources is the newly uh, added uh, alpha fold structure for GPR132. It's a predictive structure based on the alpha fold project. And you can get that now from Uniprod and from the uh, open targets. You can see that GPR-132 is highly expressed in lymphocytes, in the thyroid and spleen, and this is based on the GTEx gene landing page. We also have uh, several resources that we've developed that provide gene function predictions and a gene knowledge for understudy genes, and this is the gene function predictions from ARCHES-4. Those predict predictions are made from a gene-gene co-expression data. And here we show that a GPR-132, for example, if you look at the predicted cake pathways, have some pathways that are very relevant to uh, potentially be involved in disease. We see that it's predicted to be involved in the inflammatory bowel um, disease pathway, NF-kappa B signaling. So the way it works, it's uh, simply looking at how much GPR-132 is co-expressed with the genes within each of those pathways and then prioritizing the pathways based on the pathways that are mostly co-expressed with GPR-132. We also, in those lists of cards, have a new resource that is called Gene-Centric Geo Reverse Search. And this is an app editor that was developed by a summer student, Carolyn Chen. And what he did, he um, uh, automatically extracted about 8,000 gene expression signatures from GEO. So when you click on this um, card, you get a scatter plot that visualize uh, those 8,000 studies and how much each of them is up or down regulate a GPR-132. And then you can mouse over each of those points. And in this scatter plot, in this uh, volcano plot, uh, which is different from a regular volcano plot, um, each point is a study or it's a signature that is extracted from a study. So in this particular uh, signature, uh, uh, B cells were compared from a normal subject and the uh, uh, lupus and RA uh, patients. And then we see that uh, GPR-132 is highly overexpressed, you know, high, highly expressed in the, in the RA patient in this particular signature. And it's out of those 8,000 signatures is one of the highest, uh, um, most significant signatures su suggesting that GPR-132 is upregulated in um, a RA. 
if I'm looking at a CCL4L2, if you remember, this is the ligand that was ranked number one overall. Uh, we also see um, immune and inflammatory related um, uh, predicted in this particular case, the mouse phenotypes. And uh, this is again, the ARCHES4 gene gene uh, co-expression predictions. And you can see that there is a thymus physiology, immune tolerance, uh, antigen presenting, uh, all in, related to inflammatory related. Uh, and this is obviously a cytokine, but an understudy cytokine. And if I project that cytokine into those 8,000 uh, signatures, uh, one of them that shows downregulation of um, this particular cytokine is associated with Paget's disease, and Paget's disease is a disease of the bone, and um, it potentially could be a disease that's sort of like the opposite of a RA, where you get a fragility and deformation of bones and um, the maybe lack of inflammation and repair. So the last example that I want to show is uh, looking at the new L1000 links data, which we uh, very recently processed. It was released in April of this year, and it contains a CRISPR knockout followed by expression for all human genes, uh, including those two target genes in tensile or contact cell in tensile lines. So if I come here to this website called the Links Data Portal 3, which is unpublished yet, you can put in a CCL4L2, and then you can get a signature for it in those 10 cell lines. And once you get submit the signature, you get results for reversers and mimickers of the signature. And here I'm querying against the CRISPR, um, uh, the CRISPR signature, and I get other uh, genes that are either, when they knock out, induce similar uh, gene expression changes. And I can see that uh, the second one on the list uh, that is the most similar to CCL4L2 is CCL17, which is a cytokine that is a little bit more studied. And in a recent paper, it was suggested that as a therapy for um, arthritis. So to conclude, um, we develop a deep learning model that integrates transcriptomics, proteomics, and Go terms. And uh, we predicted novel targets for 17 pain types. And the same approach can be applied to discover targets for other diseases, obviously, and um, in many other contexts. The top ranked uh, predictions for RA, GPR 132 and CCL4L2, uh, both are pro-inflammatory and potentially uh, you could develop monoclonal uh, neutralizing antibodies uh, as potential therapies. They obviously need to be tested first in animals, but those are really promising uh, novel targets. I showed you this gene card aggregator that is uh, able to be used to, found, to find a lot of information about those genes. And in general, there's a lot of information available for those understudied genes. So even though there are no publication, there is a lot of other sources that can be used, including the ARCHES4 uh, gene function prediction, which I think is really useful for uh, finding information about genes that we don't have any publications on. And also this GEO reverse search is very powerful to find studies that can potentially be used to start thinking about, okay, I found my target, but now how I'm going to manipulate it. Um, and now I'm also pretty excited about the mRNA vaccines that can potentially be used as a protein replacement therapies. And there are a new and more, more exciting ways that once you find a target, it, you don't have to have a small molecule for it, but also with the Lynx L1000 data um, and this geo reverse search, we can find also small molecules that potentially uh, can act as uh, inducers or inhibitors for those uh, target genes. So finally, I would like to thank the members of the lab, specifically Minji and Kathleen, who uh, drove the, this project that I presented today, uh, Daniel, Clark uh, developed the apiters, 
and the um, it links a data portal that was also uh, developed by John Errol Evangelista. Uh, Sherry Chie um, processed all of the signatures from the L1000, and then Carolyn created the Appiter that queries GEO. And then Marilyn Mayers is another undergrad that was visiting our lab in the last uh, 10 weeks, and she created the um, gene aggregator uh, website. So that's it for me. Thank you all for attending and for uh, listening. I see some Q&A um, in the chat. Great, thank you very much, Avi. Um, so the first question comes from Marcus Wagner, and he asks, where did the phenotype information come from? So it came from uh, several publications that were specific about listing uh, associations between uh, different pain types and genes, as well as from uh, about eight different databases of um, uh, gene disease associations. I can go back and I can try to um, see. <laughs> Is that information in your paper? Uh, it is in the paper, but okay. it, it was a slide that it listed all of those sources. So I can maybe show that slide yeah, right here. So this is the phenotype information. And these are databases that list. Um, so it's Malacard, GOS Catalog, HPO, CleanVar, um, the mouse phenotype. So we mix mouse and humans. Uh, so that's, um, that's, those are the sources and they're listed in the paper. Thank you, Brian. Great. Um, I have a question. I, I noted GPR 132 as, as one of your main targets, as you discussed. And there is, there is actually a bit of literature about GPR 132 and pain. Um, uh, just this year, uh, a paper suggesting it mediates uh, macrophage migration in nerve injury induced uh, neuropathic pain. Um, in looking at the structure or the predicted structure from AlphaFold, um, was there anything, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at it, but was there anything about the structure that would indicate that it might be a, a, a target that's druggable by small molecules? I think if if you look at the structure, the um, both you know when it's when it's red, it means that it's very variable and unpredictive. So my guess is that the the blue areas are more common across all GPCRs, and the specificity of this uh, of the binding and the downstream effects are really determined by the. Um, uh, those two red uh, parts, uh, but honestly, I'm not an expert on, um, this is maybe something that Brian uh, Shoikit would be interested in. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna, in my talk, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about AlphaFold and uh, its utility. Um, but I just note that uh, GPR-132 is, is, uh, is an or quote unquote orphan receptor, but it's classed as a proton sensing receptor. Um, so it may or may not have a, a small molecule ligand associated with it, but certainly uh, like other proton sensing receptors is, is probably druggable. Um, Madura asks, a lot of GPCRs also cross, show crosstalk or such effects considered here in your, um, in your database. And many lipids also have some sort of allosteric effects on GPCR dynamics. Is that taken into consideration? So uh, in general, we let the neural network figure out those associations. So when we bring in uh, matrix of uh, gene gene co expression, protein protein co expression, and GO term similarity. 
and then we feed it into a neural network. The neural network is finding the uh, potential uh, nonlinear relationships between those um, variables, but we do not uh, actually um, pre-train a model, tell the model like what relationships exist, and we don't feed into a to it like a known uh, associations. But I guess in theory, it could be taking into account that information if it's in the public, if it's published somewhere, right? Yes. So it is uh, if we, you know, the Go associations are in somewhat uh, biased towards those uh, literature sources. So they assemble all of those literature sources into this knowledge graph. So that information is there, but not really directly. But you right. could add it in. And then Amelia Suerte asks, what specific type of neural network did you use in your study? So I think there was, it's described in the paper and I'm probably not the best person to answer, but I think there was, uh, uh, yeah, I don't remember offhand what Minji um, implemented, but um, yeah, it's, it's there and it's on the tip of my mind, but I don't remember the details. Okay, but it's in the paper. Yes. Okay, great, great. All right. Um, so I guess that is, uh, we're, we're about out of time and out of questions. So I wanna thank Avi for this very interesting talk. Um, and I answered Terry's question live. Um, and next, uh, Lakshmi Devi, also from Mount Sinai. And uh, as I mentioned, when I organized this, I didn't realize that uh, two of the, the first two speakers were from Mount Sinai. Um, I don't have any, I have just in, in full disclosure, I have no affiliation with Mount Sinai School of Medicine. It's just, they have terrific researchers there. Um, our next speaker is uh, Lakshmi Devi. Uh, for those of you who um, follow the opiate receptor field, she is a pioneer uh, in the field, has made just a huge number of really important contributions. And today she's gonna to tell us about uh, her recent work on opiate signaling uh, as it relates to therapeutics. So go ahead, Lakshmi. I'd like to start by thanking uh, Brian for the invitation and uh, uh, and let me do this for a minute. Okay. And today um, you can hear me, right? Okay. Christina. Yes, we can hear yes. you fine. Yep, we can yeah. hear you. Good. Good. Last time there was an issue. The last talk I gave. Okay. So, um, so what I thought I'd do today is actually talk about some, uh, some really exciting work that's going on in my lab uh, that focuses on a really old problem. How we got there um, is the journey that I'm going to talk to you about. However, before, we get, uh, before I get into uh, the exciting stuff, I'm going to share with you some of the work that we did as a continuation of last talk with Avi Mayan. So this was a uh, PhD thesis work for a student of mine, Stephen Stockton. What he did was to try to figure out the proteins that are um, uh, modulated, regulated by morphine and by using a combination of proteomics and network analysis. And, and, and the reason I'm, I'm sharing this with you is um, to impact um, come uh, bring to your attention a resource that we recently developed that might be of use to some of you. So how did we get there? Uh, we got there by chronically treating the animals with morphine and, and collecting after five days of treatment, collecting the uh, striata and subjecting them to this differential centrifugation step. This is, was uh, published, has been published, um, a Greg Phillips at Sinai actually at that time um, um, came up th with this idea of isolating uh, synaptosomes and slightly washing them lightly to uh, 
purify or, or um, separate out the synaptic junctions by Triton and then uh, by a low high pH wash separate out the PSD from the presynaptic um, fraction. This is a phenomenal way of trying to figure out what is in the presynapse and the postsynapse, but we were interested in the synaptic junction. So what we did was to do differential isotopic labeling of the synaptic, uh, synaptic junctions from the, the morphine treated animals and um, saline treated animals and subject them to proteomic analysis and that led to the identification of 2600 proteins and though among them, since we did multiple labeling, uh, labeling with multiple uh, different isotopes, we were able to actually come up with a list of 34 statistically significant proteins that were statistically significantly differentially altered. Um, now, uh, in addition to the statistical significance, what Avi did was uh, use his magic of resources that he develops continuously. This is a few years ago, as you see. Um, uh, predicted the networks that are up or down regulated. And see, in this here is a validation, one of the, the, pro, the, the protein, one of the uh, hubs and the proteins associated that are, are shown to be upregulated by morphine, we went back and validated by, by Western blotting. So what we did more recently is actually take that list of the synaptic proteins that are highly, um, um, regulated or of interest to many in the field and developed an anti a set of antibodies. This was done, done in collaboration with a small company called Avengen and they are selling these antibodies. And this is uh, through a, an SBIR and the focus of my lab was to actually validate some of the antibodies. This is published so I don't want to go through the details of how we got there. These are rabbit monoclonals and what we did was for validation uh, to first uh, um, compare the relative expression of the um, uh, relative recognition um, of uh, by the antibodies of the proteins in neuro 2A cells versus uh, hex cells. Neuro 2A cells are the neuronal cell lines that express a lot of neuronal proteins. Hex cells obviously do not, the embryonic kidney cells. So we just did the comparison of relative abundance of these proteins and there was a fairly good match. There was many of them showed high level of uh, expression in neuro 2A. And then we went back and for a subset of them, we actually went back and purified uh, uh, synaptosomes and compared it to uh, brain fractions. Here is shown for one of the proteins. To, to show that in fact, um, some of them actually only recognize that, that protein. For a subset of um, the another set of proteins, what we did was to actually generate um, um, tagged proteins. In here is a D1 dopamine receptor, where this is our antibody uh, generated, generated recognizing the native protein. Here is a mixed tagged uh, receptor. Now it's the um, same um, number of uh, same clones are being recognized by both our antibody as well as the MIC antibody. We all, okay, so here is a list. I, I show you, this is all published. This is in supplementary material. We went back uh, heroically. Mariana Duarte, who is the first author in the paper, took advantage of the COVID time uh, <laughs> to actually process this data. We had this data, we hadn't processed it. She went back and, and, and made, made, made it uh, pretty. Uh, looking, um, put, put it all together during this time. And so here's the Western blotting. For some of them, we actually went back and did um, immunocytochemistry. So to, show, to actually see a um, specific localization of these uh, proteins within the cell. And for a subset of them, we actually went back and uh, we, meaning uh, Mariana, went back and did a CRISPR-Cas9 knockout of, of uh, uh, proteins to show that in fact, the, uh, they have a specificity. And we, um, in, in the process of developing antibodies had generated antibodies to C-terminal phosphorylatable residues. This is phospho-specific antibody 363 and 370 of mu opioid receptor. Well, there is a reason for picking these two, two, two uh, sites and that is because of of um, uh, the importance of the phosphorylation by these two, uh, at these two sites by protein kinase C and because of uh, Mariana's passion in protein kinase C. 
Protein kinase C has been known to play a central role in myopoietic receptor activity. A number of people have shown in different ways that PKC plays a role in, in uh, modulating morphine sensitization, analgesia, and interception tolerance, et cetera. And all of these studies have actually used inhibitors of PKC. And some studies actually, um, uh, Michelle, um, American Alts has actually used biosensors, PKC biosensors and others to actually show PKC activity, um, um, PKC being activated after morphine administration. So but the problem was that can we actually use this uh, technology to develop antibodies that recognizes native PKC, okay? So for that, um, uh, we need to take a look at um, classical PKCs they have many many domains, and the important thing is PKC is kept is activated by a number of uh, cofactors, but it is kept inactive by um, the, these auto inhibitory domains. It's almost like it's a it's a closed uh, protein that opens up when uh, it gets activated. So what we did was to actually target the activated part that is not exposed in the inactive state, target that area. And this is actually a study that we had done in collaboration with Deborah Sheckman at, uh, at the University of Sao Paulo by Darlene Pena had, had, had actually showed that targeting this region, um, pseudorac region is, is called, um, in fact, you're able to make antibodies that selectively uh, recognizes um, uh, the, the, the active PKC. Here is wild type cells that are being activated by PMA, you can see that the, now the PKC is, is, is being recognized. When you knock out PKC alpha, the uh, very signal is gone. So this is a highly specific confirmation selective active site directed PKC antibody. And here, here it is, um, um, shows the uh, time course of activation. So, we went on to then ask what happens if you treat the cells, um, uh, you know, neuro to a and then this is uh, neuro to a cells with morphine versus fentanyl. And we found that this is now uh, PKC um, uh, knockout cells obviously have very little um, activity in neuro to a cells ex um, treated with, uh, with morphine, there is an increase in active PKC that goes down to basal in the case of morphine and doesn't go down to basal in the case of fentanyl. And another interesting thing is only in the case of fentanyl, down regulation of PKC or knocking out of PKC alpha causes an upregulation of another PKC that is being recognized by this antibody. So this is a pan classical PKC antibody. It's not uh, uh, isoform specific. Nonetheless, the point is that we are able to now look at differences in the dynamics of uh, PKC acti um, active PKC uh, being um, activated by differentially by morphine versus fentanyl. So we got interested in how does this relate to endogenous system? So before that, I can act, uh, have to do one more uh, uh, plug-in that these antibodies can actually also be used for uh, looking at native PKC activity in vivo. This is after acute morphine administration, after 30 minutes after morphine administration, this in the striata, you can actually look at, you can see PKC being um, activated. But this is uh, done uh, by Darlene and been repeated by Erin Bobek um, and her um, student uh, Akila Ram, it's, which is uh, in the published uh, paper. So we were interested in how does this um, active PKC dynamics compare between morphine, fentanyl versus endogenous systems? And first surprise came, this is now in the CHO cells. We converted the um, assay from single cell based uh, cytometric assay to um, ELISA assay because it's an antibody. We can look at enzyme linked um, uh, increases in recognition as, as a high throughput way of looking at things. And we find, in fact, that fentanyl is better than morphine, but beta endorphin and peptide E um, seem to be really um, activated quite highly uh, and, and sustained activity compared to uh, um, uh, the, the drugs. So this got us to actually thinking about what about other kinases? So we recently went back and looked at ERK kinase activity by a number of opioid peptides. These are four peptides here, some from pro encavalin derived peptides and some uh, pro um, opium melanocortin derived peptide and pro dynorphin derived peptide activating mu receptors. 
this is kind of a little strange, you're thinking, well, shouldn't they be selective in our hands? And people have published that already, including Laura, that these peptides have receptor promiscuity and they actually differentially activate different kinases. Here it is, ERK, we looked at junk and uh, the, the profile of, of activity is different. For example, dynofin A that shows um, very uh, high potency activity in P activating P uh, ERK has no activity at junk or at uh, uh, P38. So there is differential activity and, and this was fascinating. So we took a step back and actually took a, a look at what are the peptides that are activating these receptors and turns out there are 20 of them. So um, the arrows point to the ones that I already talked to you about or mentioned in my talk and turns out that there, there are a number of these opioid peptides. I've defined here opioid peptide as those that contain this um, enkephalin motif of tyre gly gly phi. This is supposed, uh, this is considered to be the, um, the address um, a part of, of the sequence. Uh, this actually allows these peptides to bind opioid receptors and the rest is considered the message to differentially signal. So we actually went back and um, started wondering about this classic paradigm. One, one peptide, one receptor, we knew this, right? This is what people, this is what is classical people think is happening. Turns out, Danofin A, people have found, binds to all three types of opioid receptors, okay? We also know that peptides derived from different precursors bind to one receptor. And finally, binding studies by Al Mansur carried out a long, long time ago, and we repeated it more recently, and many people have done this, that many of these peptides are able to bind to all of these receptors. So what gives, right? So we actually did a systematic analysis of all of these 20 peptides signaling through either the G protein pathway or the arresting pathway at mu, delta, and cap receptors and compared potencies. This is kind of the bias comparing here. Zero is um, considered is, is the is the standard. We use DAMGO for mu, it's classic ligand, deltorphin. Uh, for delta, it's classic ligand, and U69 for kappa, it's classic ligand. Cons you know, com compared to the bias or compared to the ability of the classic standard uh, to activate the, the uh, G protein or the arresting pathway, you find that these peptides actually, um, you can uh, com compare across the receptors, have different kinds of uh, preferences, or within the, the, the receptor itself, some, the shorter peptide peptides, prefer to activate G protein and longer ones prefer to actually um, recruit arresting compared to G protein. Uh, my history has been with dynorphins long, long time ago. I was a postdoctoral fellow with Alvin Goldstein when dynorphins were actually purified for the first time. But nonetheless, I've always been fascinated by these two dynorphin peptides, dynorphin A and dynorphin B, which share the, the first six amino acids that are identical. Uh, uh, seven amino acids, and only last few amino acids are different. And for all intents purposes, these were con considered to have the same affinity, same potency, and many of the signal transduction pathways. So we didn't know why there were so many different peptides that are binding and activating so many different receptors. More importantly, same peptides that have same kind of sequences, same kind of affinity, same kind of potencies, what are they doing? First um, um, uh, answer was that dynafin B and A actually have different preferences at kappa. B prefers G protein activity, activation compared to um, uh, beta arresting. Now they also are differential. If you can look at um, dynafin A17 is neutral, for example, at mu versus it is, uh, you know, prefers arresting. Um, at, at Delta and Kappa. So this, this is all published. There's lots and lots and lots more data. You can go back and look at it. So we started wondering, um, so the, this difference between the G protein versus the arrestin, does that translate to anything more than just the G protein signaling or arrestin based signaling? And one of the things arrestins do, as you know, is actually lead to receptor endocytosis. So we started wondering maybe there are differences in the endocytic dynamics, you know, the, the rates of endocytosis, or um, the um, extent of endocytosis or the escort proteins that they associate with and so on and so forth. 
for that, actually, I began a collab. I, I don't. I don't need to go through this whole um, scheme of endocytosis for GPCRs. Just that GPCRs get activated through G proteins, and then once they're activated, they uh, phosphorylate at the C tail, bind arestin, and they get endocytosed. And and Mark Van Zastrow and many others have shown that in the endosomes they are able to signal. And then um, the classic idea is that the, the then slowly the, the ligand dissociates or gets degraded and then the receptor gets dephosphorylated, receptor can get recycled or degrade, degraded. So to study the differential internalization and then and, and, and this pathway of trafficking, I collaborated with the Manoj Putan Vidu at the University of Michigan who has this um, tagged receptor and this tagged receptor is fluorescent when it is a neutral pH and, and becomes, uh, um, um, quench, gets quenched in acidic pH. What he um, um, does is actually ask, um, has the, the cells that express the receptor treat with the pe peptide or ligand, receptors endocytosed, he bleaches the cell surface and then looks at recycling. What are the receptors uh, when, you know, can you see the receptors being re, uh, fluorescent, you know, binding and, and, and showing fluorescence. And I'll show you an example of that here. You can keep looking in this area, you can see these, all of this is a vesicular fuser, fusing moment where the receptor is becoming fluorescent. And you see that when it's recycling and there is no, this is now for turf microscopy recycling and no recycling, there is no fluorescence appearance on, on the cell surface. So uh, Jamie Kunzelman for her PhD thesis did that. This is now published in eLife this year, it came out. And she quantified the number of these recycling events, the puffs, they call it. Um, that there were very, very few number of puffs that are coming out for dinofin A17 as compared to dinofin B, suggesting that there was uh, dinofin A17 uh, mediate, uh, engaged receptor is in an intracellular compartment, doesn't come back out, whereas dinofin B engaged receptor recycles. U69 also keeps its receptor in an intracellular compartment. We also, we meaning Jenny and, and Manoj, went on to show that this internalized receptor in fact engages this nanobody, which um, is a surrogate for showing that the receptor is actually active in the endosomes. And we, uh, Manoj actually and Jenny went back to show that not just in the endosomes, in the endolysosomes, as the receptor is being degraded, when it com even when it fuses, the endosomes fuse with the lysosomes, it is being able to be engaged with the nanobodies, suggesting that actually in the endolysosomes, dinofin A17 is signaling. And now they are beginning to explore the differential gene expression patterns that come out of these endosomal signaling uh, receptors. So um, uh, there is, uh, this is what I showed you on the left panel here. The summary of this part is the fact that um, the receptor gets endocytosed in ranofin A17, um, engaged receptor signals in, in endolysosomes and then goes through a degradation compartment. We went in, in this paper, uh, we nicely showed that, whereas the dynafin B13 bound receptor recycles. So of course we were interested in seeing what happens with the other peptides and no, not surprisingly, some peptides like dinofin. Uh, so here is what I, okay. First of all, this is now we have converted this whole, all of this recycling, recycling assay into ELISA based assay. You're now looking at the amount of uh, receptors that come back to the cell surface after 30 minutes of internalization. And dinofin B13, 100% of it comes back to the cell surface. Dinofin A17 goes, is inside and doesn't come back out and gets degraded. U69, as you saw, we can replicate that. We saw it in the turf microscopy, and here, so U69 doesn't come back, treated receptor doesn't come back out. BAM18, which is a pro encephalin peptide, also causes the receptor to stay inside. Now, the surprise is this is in cap receptors. Remember, I told you that um, all of these peptides are able to engage mu receptors. And when you look at this receptor recycling in mu receptors, now, a17 recycles, and so does B13, so does BAM18. And fentanyl is able to recycle um, the receptors, not as much as oxycodone. 
So there might be differences in gene expression. I, we don't know whether the endos, endocytosed uh, oxycodone, how much of, of it goes into the endolysosomal pathway, gets degraded, and how much of that is actually signaling. It'd be really fascinating to see differential signaling by oxycodone versus fentanyl. But more importantly, what I am interested in actually going back and looking at all of the 20 peptides and seeing what is the differential signaling right? But I showed you that the differential is signaled through the, the, the different kinases. And what is differential trafficking? And this trafficking actually ends up leading into location-based signaling. So what are the differences in the location-based signaling? So in summary, um, using the East display um, screen, V, which is uh, with Avengen generated antibodies to 130, 35 synaptic proteins, and a uh, subset of them are confirmation sensitive. We focused on PKC and showed that this antibody can actually recognize native PKC. And you can activate the native receptors, activate um, and look at the activation of native PKC with a, with, a, with, a, with a dynamic activation in cells and tissues. I also mentioned that endogenous opioid peptides exhibit the receptor promiscuity. This is many people have shown that. Elisa Margolis um, at UCSF has begun to look at the BTA um, uh, dopamine neurons to show, and we have now evidence to show that the mu receptor, the mu receptor there is being activated by dynorphins or and the cap receptors by um, uh, by the, the uh, non-dynorphin peptides. And the more importantly, what we showed that the endogenous peptides lead to differential signaling, many different signaling pathway that, that we have explored and we are exploring for all of the peptides now. What is exciting is that the opioid drugs and peptides differentially affect receptor trafficking. It'll be really important to match which of the uh, drugs um, match with each of the peptide trafficking and also compare the location-based signaling that we see. So uh, the bottom line is that each opioid peptide is not redundant, it is unique, and it appears to exhibit distinct signaling profile that then would expand the opioid receptor signaling repertoire. So with that, I would like to acknowledge the people in the lab. This is our happy hour during the pandemic in Central Park. Um, uh, this was not during the pandemic, we had to distance past the pandemic, of course. So this is Marianne Duarte, who did most of the work on the confirmation selective antibodies and the antibody validation. Yvonne Gomes and Achala Gupta have been carrying on um, the studies. Yvonne did all of the work on the differential signaling uh, by the peptides, and Achala is now developing um, ELISA assays for all of the kinases. With the help of the other people in the lab, I have to acknowledge uh, Deborah Sheckman, who got me excited about um, looking at PKC and how we can target um, the unique areas of PKC to make active site directed antibodies. Alisa Margolis is an ongoing collaboration. We are looking at um, the VTA um, uh, neurons um, signaling because they're very central to opioid transmission, and we are actually, um, she is profiling. Um, 16 neurons at a time using multi um, electrode array recording, uh, sampling to the, uh, the activity uh, and comparing the opioid drugs to opioid peptides. And of course, Manoj Patampudambir has been central in doing this um, live cell imaging and live cell imaging of the ex um, exocytotic events and uh, looking at uh, differential tra trafficking by um, um, opioid peptides. With that, I would like to take uh, questions. Okay. Thank you very much. That's really a exciting uh, presentation. Um, we have a question here from Mohammed Nor Norial. Mm -hmm. um, our, let's see here. I don't know what this question our is. Our receptors are different from viral receptors, I guess. If so, in what way possibly? Thank you. I think it is viral. Um, yeah, opiate receptors are classified by a uh, long time ago. They were defined, they're different from viral receptors. They, 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 they were uh, um, they were named based on the ligands that they bound. So mu was uh, uh, named after morphine that it bind, bound as its first Greek letter and delta D, 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 and keflin and kappa for ketocyclazosine. So these, these receptors were defined as opioid receptors because not only bound opioid ligands, 
opioids are the, the one, but also they could be displaced by the opiate antagonist, the classic antagonist, naloxone. So that's kind of the definition in the field for what opiate receptors are. As I mentioned, the, the, the once the peptides that bind and activate opiate receptors were identified, uh, um, Charlie Chapkin originally and, and, and many people defined the region that's important for the opiate activity, which is the first four amino acids. And so that's kind of how we define the opioid receptors. So they're different from vital receptors. Great. Um, and uh, I, have, I have a couple of questions. The first is that, that very nice sort of um, in vivo phosphorylation of uh, PK, I guess, PKC alpha. Mm -hmm. um, by mu receptor activation. Mm -hmm. um, and did you notice if that was related to the patch or the matrix uh, compartment of the striatum? Um, it is the matrix. Okay. So I guess mu receptors are what? I, I, I always forget. Are they in the patch or the matrix? I think it's the matrix. Patch is a hole. Yes. The, you have the holes and the matrix, right? Yeah. So we're actually, the, um, that was a... Um, a, a that particular study was done to show that these antibodies work. Right. For immunosetic chemistry, right? Now we are doing a very, very um, defined, detailed study with Elisa Margolis. Ah, okay. in, in the both in the habenula and in the striatum. And right. we, are, uh, we are mapping um, uh, with the phosphorus site-specific antibody. You know, we also have antibodies to mu that at right. size that are phosphorylated, right? So we are doing the correlation. So it's a detailed right. study is being done. Right. Okay. And, and the first thing is that, that the antibodies are, are very se selective, so that's nice. Yeah. yeah. So Terry has has a question, and this is something I was wondering as well. I'm glad you asked this. So she says, "Do we infer that specific enzyme patterns exist to produce these different peptides in various intracellular compartments, or are they all cleaved into the array of peptides extracellularly?" Okay. Um, okay. So uh, hi, Terry. Nice, nice to meet you again. Um, the different peptides, um, yeah, the answer is yes and yes. S majority of the peptides that I've shown are actually differentially processed in, in, the, uh, in the axons. However, depending on the length of time the, pe the uh, uh, peptides um, sits in the vesicle, it goes through more, uh, increased processing. So larger peptides are made and then they're processed and you know, they're made in the Golgi and then they go, um, as they uh, move through the vesicles, they get shorter and shorter. So initially, um, when you have the first synaptic transmission, the shorter peptides come out. If immediately you have a second bolus of hyperpolarization and then the, the, the uh, antipolarization that the peptides have to be released, then that set of peptides is going to be longer. Okay, now, these peptides that are released go through extracellular peptide processing as well. And there is something called volume transmission, you know that, right? So that when they release, they actually go diffuse away from the synaptic uh, um, cleft. And, and while they diffuse away, they're able to be processed to shorter peptides. So those um, receptors that are extrasynaptic or further away are going to be activated by different set of peptides than those that are right there at the synapse. Great. So we have a couple other questions that you could, hopefully you could answer uh, online, Lakshmi. Mm -hmm. um, I wanna thank you really for this really exciting talk. Okay. Um, really pro thought provoking. And uh, next I'd like to introduce uh, Laura Bond. Are you there, Laura? Yes? Yes. Hi, Laura, Hello. how are you? I am good, thanks. So Laura as well is a, is a real pioneer in the, in the field of opiate receptor uh, pharmacology and biology. And I don't know what the title of your talk is, Laura, but I'm sure oh, it will be, let's see. What's that? Oh, okay. So <laughs> she's gonna talk to us today about modulating oh. mu receptors to improve pain treatment and avoid side effects. And she's currently at Scripps. So thank you very much. Go ahead, Laura. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Brian, for inviting me and thank you for hosting uh, this uh, webinar. And um, I will try to walk you through uh, some of our recent 
uh, findings and how we are trying. And I think it really builds nicely off of what Lakshmi has just presented in introducing this concept that uh, it's more than just one pathway. It's more than just one response. The receptor is a rather complex unit. So I will, um, oh, why isn't it moving? There we go. Okay, so I will briefly touch on my introduction because she's already done this for us. Um, but to say that, you know, the opioid receptors, we think of them as um, these conduits of receiving a, a drug or an agonist or antagonist, and that they are known to couple to G proteins. And so the idea that you turn on, um, I have this wrong, this should be the agonist antagonist, uh, that the agonist would come in and turn things on and then the antagonist would come in and turn it off. And this would be the on off switch uh, approach. So um, on and off, but as Lakshmi has told you, this is far much uh, more complicated in that receptors uh, are expressed throughout different tissues. They're located in different cell types and in their locations, they have the potential to interact with many different uh, partners. And so this whole idea of um, biased agonism or ligand directed signaling is, is that maybe you could harness some of these signaling pathways that may be unique for certain tissues or in certain conditions or in response to certain drugs that may um, lead to a favorable physiology over an adverse physiology. And this is kind of a general idea for all GPCRs. Now, there's nothing to say that the advent adverse events and the desirable events have to be separate pathways. And in some cases, they're likely same pathways. But knowing that multiple pathways exist downstream of receptors gives us an opportunity to start to, to determine, can we tease out uh, preferential signaling? And so um, in my talk, I'm gonna talk about two key signaling elements that we approached and that's G protein signaling and arrestin. And we did this because they're proximal uh, proteins that bind directly to the receptor. And they have had um, classically oppositional roles where the receptor upon agonist activation combined to the G protein and lead to um, a signal. And then upon phosphorylation by GRKs, the kinases can lead to uh, beta arrestin association, which can prevent uh, further signaling. So we know it's very proximal and it's responsive to ligand both of these events. Um, the other thing about beta arrestins that make them interesting is that as a scaffolding protein, they sit at the top of the cascade and can help to organize and, and get ready to go for other downstream events. So they could play a role in internalizing receptors, desensitizing receptors, bringing in ubiquitin ligases, bringing in other signaling molecules, and really can serve as these multifunctional scaffolding um, domains for orientation. And so with that in mind, I, I throw this really complicated figure, and if you'd like to read more, it's published in a, in a review article in Biological Psychiatry, that we recognize that it's a lot more than just G protein, one single G protein, and a beta arrestin interaction at the top of receptor um, communication to the cell. But likely that there's multiple events, there's multiple proteins, and, there's, um, and it's diverse within different tissues that will contribute to a downstream effect. Okay, with that disclaimer in mind, I'm now going to reduce this back down to looking at these two top of the cascade uh, proteins of interaction. And based on a lot of um, in vivo work looking at beta arrestin knockout mice, beta arrestin 2 specifically, um, we propose that we should be able to eliminate some of the side effects uh, associated with mu agonists. Um, if we could avoid the beta arrestin interaction. And particularly, uh, I'm gonna to focus today on uh, the development of tolerance and respiratory suppression. Okay, so this was work published a few years ago, and I wanna talk about our, um, why we did this. So we know that working in mouse models, things change. It's been shown over and over again, we lose some of the respiratory uh, benefit of uh, in the beta arrestin 2 knockout mice when they're on a C57 background. We know that uh, mice are not little people. Um, and so our goal was really, if we think this hypothesis has any validity, well, we should be able to make ligands that will test the hypothesis independent of these different rodent models and uh, our background. So we, we developed a number of compounds that display G protein signaling preference over beta arrestin and others have done that, Brian Roth has done that. Um, and what's really cool is that uh, whether it's the PZM structure that Brian has or the oliseridine structure um, that Trevina uh, has now approved, 
uh, or even these structures, we do see a, a beginning of a, a separation of the respiratory suppression away from the antinociception, saying we really could be on to something. So on this work, I just want to touch on a few concepts here. First is um, basically what we're measuring in signaling bias. Like I told you, there's the G protein aspect, and this is a GTP gamma S binding assay. This is the scaffold that our compounds are built on. And I'm going to just use a couple examples here briefly because there's been this idea that maybe it's not really biased agonism, that maybe it's just because they're partial agonists uh, that we see this benefit for respiratory suppression. But I would like to point out, if you do just a standard GTP gamma S binding assay, this is in a CHO cell line developed by NIDA years ago, um, that you can see that morphine is, a, yes, a partial relative to DAMGO, and I mean partial, it gives submaximal response compared to DAMGO. Our compounds here, 17, 18, um, is also a partial. The fentanyl is, is a partial in this assay, and we're not the only ones to have uh, noticed this, and this was reported back when these assays were still done widely. Um, but we also looked at a compound here, 14968, which is a full agonist compared to DAMGO. So with this in mind, um, when we look at bias, we also ran the compounds in an arrestin assay. So this is a, con a commercial assay, a Discover X Pathhunter assay that anyone can run. And this one um, really reveals how much uh, fentanyl is a partial. And we have morphine as a partial. And we have 1718, which hardly produces any stimulation until you get over 10 micromolar, we start to see the curve climb. And so we can do some mathematical modeling, but you can pretty well see that we have differences uh, in their ability to recruit arrestin. And I will note that 14968 here is on its way to being a full, um, and it's really hard to tell, but we know in, at least in G-protein signaling, it's a full agonist. So with that in mind, we look at these, I'm gonna use these more in this talk, so I wanted to just touch base on them. This is how they perform in signaling assays, and then we move into, um, we, and we also wanna move into mice. So I'm not gonna show you data, but we made sure it, these compounds actually stimulate the brainstem mu opioid receptor. Uh, they don't do anything immune knockout mice. They're selective for mu over other uh, opioid receptors and many others that have been tested uh, both by Brian's psychoactive drug screening program and also by the Sarah panel. And uh, they have a very nice stable pharmacokinetic profile and they get into brain. So that's really important if we're going to compare it to morphine. So when we compared their responses uh, in different tests, we, we compared their thermal nociception. So this is a hot plate test. And I'm just showing you here fentanyl, morphine, and 1718. Fentanyl, of course, is very potent in the hot plate test. These are dose response curves. And this is uh, 1718 and morphine are very similar in their potency. In respiratory um, suppression, I'm sorry, I lost a, oh, I must have an animation. <laughs> um, you can see that fentanyl still very uh, effectively promotes respiratory suppression uh, potently. Morphine, you have a little bit of a, a, a gain here in the therapeutic window. And 17, 18, we see very little, if any, respiratory suppression. And I've kind of overlaid the two graphs here where you can see what we talk about with a the therapeutic window, whereas this, um, the degree of separation between the antinosusceptive response and the respiratory uh, response. So there's morphine, morphine's not a bad drug. And in 1718, we got a little better, we're a little wider because we can go for high doses, much higher than what's required to produce antinociception and avoid respiratory suppression. So it was summarized recently that perhaps all the 1718, buprenorphine, PZM21, oliseridine had less respiratory suppression simply because they're partial agonists. And I, I think we addressed that in 2017 because we actually picked one of our compounds here, 14968, is a full agonist, and while these are partial, um, and 14968 also shows a preference for G-protein over uh, beta rest and recruitment, as I showed you previously. And so even though it's a full agonist and these are partials, um, here's the 178, or here is uh, fentanyl, and you can see there's that very narrow window, but here's 14968. It has a, a very nice separation between hot plate and respiratory suppression. And so even though um, there is a response in the respiratory, we do get protection even out of a full agonist. And so I think there are exceptions that it's not just a partial agonism. And moreover, we had another compound, this one 11501, 
This is a partial agonist. It looks identical to morphine and G-protein coupling. Um, it looks pretty similar to fentanyl. In fact, it's less uh, full than fentanyl here. Um, and it gives pretty good uh, antinosusceptive responses, but at the same doses that it produces uh, antinosusception in a hot plate test, it induces massive respiratory suppression. So here's an example of a partial agonist that still gives a lot of respiratory suppression. So I don't think that we can just summarize and say, because we can identify five partial agonists that produce less uh, respiratory suppression, it doesn't mean that that's all that's at play here. And I think, um, we address this in a lot more detail. This is a paper we've submitted to biochemistry and I, I'm thinking we can make our three reviewers happy and um, hopefully it will be uh, in, in print, but right now you can find it in bioarchive. So that's all I wanna say about that. And I wanna talk a little bit, since this is a biochemistry of pain meeting, how we've been able to use these compounds to, um, to test them for chronic treatment in, uh, in chronic um, opiate administration. So years ago, we had uh, shown that uh, in the beta arrestin 2 knockout mice, if we chronically gave morphine, we could have a little bit of tolerance, but, but not that much as the dose response curve in the hot plate response. This is a wild type. You get this big shift in, in potency. And in the knockouts, we, there was some protection against the development of tolerance. So then we said, well, how about if we give this 1718, which doesn't recruit very much beta arrestin, what will happen? And so we compared it to morphine in a pump because the pharmacokinetics of morphine are rapid and we wanted to have consistent levels. The pharmacokinetics of SR1718 is slow and it's orally a bioavailable. And most importantly, if you inject it daily, it will precipitate and you will not have drug circulating in the blood. So it's really important that we gave this orally because we want to give it at really high doses. And to be a control for the oral dosing, we used oxycodone because it's orally bioavailable. Okay, so this is just showing you that we care about pharmacokinetics. And because we wanted to test whether this one could induce um, tolerance, we know oxycodone, we know morphine induces tolerance. So we wanted to administer the compound, the test compound at higher levels than what we were gonna give morphine and um, oxycodone. So that's that was our paradigm. You can see here 12 hours, we really aren't getting much clearance. This is a very long lasting compound. And details are also published in, in uh, neuropsychopharmacology last year. So after chronic administration of 24 and 48 mg per kg of morphine, we get what we expect, a, a two-fold or four-fold shift in potency in the hot plate test suggesting tolerance. For 1718, we only see a very little bit of a shift, a 1.3-fold shift, um, although we can reach maximum and only at the 48 mg per kg. So very little development of tolerance after chronic treatment with 1718. With oxycodone, um, you get robust tolerance at 24 mg per kg, uh, a three-fold shift in potency. So we, we didn't even go further with oxycodone. So that's encouraging. Uh, we took this then into additional pain assays. I'm not going to talk about it, but I, I think it's interesting, especially in regard to Lakshmi's talk about the role of PKC. And we've proposed that perhaps in, in earlier work that the PKC uh, pathway may be really pre prevalent in uh, spinal cord. Um, and that you would find that in the 2020 paper, um, we do get, or in this 2021 paper, that we do get some tolerance in the tail flick response and spinal mechanisms. Um, we tested also chronic treatment in other pain assays. This is a, um, a formalin injected induced PAW uh, inflammation and pain. And here we measure uh, flinching, and this is the acute potency and basically upon acute dose response curves. The take home is that 1718 is as potent as morphine and oxycodone, um, particularly in the second phase of the assay, it has less efficacy in the first phase. And then if we chronically give the, the drugs just as we had before, and here's oxycodone versus 1718, Oxycodone loses um, its ability to suppress the pain response after chronic treatment here, whereas 1718 continues to have efficacy upon chronic treatment, uh, particularly seen in the second phase of treatment. Okay, so then because this is a pain meeting, um, I, I wanted to share the results in a paclitaxel induced neuropathic pain model. Um, in this case, we're measuring tactile allodynia by von Frey filament um, pressure. 
and we are doing this after a paclitaxel pretreatment of over a week, and then we measure um, responses on day seven, 11, and 14 to determine that we had um, a hypersensitivity and allodynia develop. And that's shown here. This would be at the baseline. The gray line is the average of all the mice. This is the um, allodynia that forms after 14 days. And the orange line is the sum of all the mice. And these are paired analyses where vehicle has no effect to reverse it. But 14 or 17, 18 here um, is able to reverse the, uh, the allodynia at low doses, 1, 3, 6, 12, uh, mix per kg of SR 17, 18 applied acutely. Uh, this is morphine. It's known that opiates usually are really great in this model. Um, and morphine, while it does reverse the um, or suppress the uh, enhanced pain response in the allodynic model, um, it's still not quite as good as 1718, which we found surprising that this was so potent in this uh, assay because in the hot plate assay, it's very similar to morphine. So we then took this model uh, to test chronic dosing in the neuropathic pain model. So we didn't want to keep treating mice day 14 and then do another week of oral dosing because we felt that for the vehicle, that would be just too much handling of these animals for uh, vehicle oral dosing. So we started at eight days because we saw at day seven, we already had all of the uh, um, allodynia had developed and it was consistent through day 14. So we started at day seven and twice a day um, oral dosing of vehicle oxycodone or 1718. And then we measure at 60 minutes after the drug, um, the, the paw pressure. And so the vehicle had no effect. They, um, the uh, animals are still hyper responsive. And in the presence of uh, 1718 at 24 mg per kg on day one, it reversed. And at 24 mg per kg after three days of chronic twice a day treatment, um, it's still fully efficacious. Uh, oxycodone in this model did not work very well. We didn't get a real significant reversal at day one, so we can't really comment on the tolerance that developed. But again, 1718 um, re retains efficacy upon chronic treatment and, and work quite well, uh, even at these very high doses to have chronic treatment retained its efficacy in this pain essay. So I'll just summarize this part briefly, and then I wanna present some unpublished data uh, where partial agonism cannot really fully explain the improved therapeutic uh, index in the G-protein signaling bias agonist. Whoops, whoops, there we go. And chronic administration of 1718 retains efficacy in most of the pain assays that we looked at, and it's more potent, more potent than oxycodone and morphine in the neuropathic pain model. Um, so the big question that we have going forward are, you know, we looked at beta resins for our screen to try to find uh, compounds that would recruit G protein signaling and not recruit arrestins. Um, but is this really why we're seeing these improved benefits in vivo? And the big question is why do these agonists appear to promote pre preferential G protein signaling and why is there less tolerance uh, in vivo? And so to kind of get at these mechanistic questions, we went back into a very conventional uh, classic desensitization cell-based assay. So these are CHO cells that express the mu, the same ones we used in all of our screening. And it's known that if you chronically treat with a drug like morphine, so two hours in the dish with morphine or fentanyl, and then you add, um, and then you test whether Damco can still stimulate G-protein coupling, you'll find the desensitization. And that can be characterized by a shift in the potency and sometimes a decrease in the efficacy. And that's just show, this has been shown many, many times by many investigators. And we're repeating it here, showing you that fentanyl uh, and morphine will do this, as well as this compound, which we had shown to be a lot like fentanyl uh, in that it doesn't, uh, it's related to our bias ligands, but it seems to prefer beta arrestin more than G protein. So it's similar scaffold, different bias profile. So then we did the same experiment with the, the bias ligands, and this was somewhat surprising. So first, olaserdine, we, we saw did desensitize uh, the receptor, and we've seen that published by others as well now. Um, however, when we looked at 1718 and 14968, we get this very strange effect. Um, we don't see much more stimulation with 14968. We get this flat line, but 14968 and 1718 pretreatment leads to an elevation in the baseline of signal. So 
you can see this is raw CPMs. This is just the raw data from multiple experiments and we have an elevated baseline. Um, so this led us to think, well, maybe this is an agonist that's binding irreversibly to the mu opioid receptor. And so the first thing we ask is, well, can we, can we reverse it? And so first we stimulate, this is the two hour pretreatment. Um, everything's up at this level over here, they're real high. And then we put on naloxone to say, can we displace that? And here you can see using, uh, da, 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 using naloxone or using CTOP, a larger pep, uh, cyclic peptide antagonist, we can displace or accurately inhibit the um, bias ligand's ability to stimulate G-protein coupling. So this is a naloxone reversible activation, but it still appears to be um, irreversibly bound. So how can these two things be true, that a compound can irreversibly bind or tightly bind and lead to constitutive activation of G-protein signaling, yet still be susceptible to an antagonist? Well, a simple answer would be they're binding to different sites. And so um, another answer is that perhaps we've just treated the cells in such a way with these compounds that they've non-specifically upregulated G protein signaling in some non-specific manner. So the next thing we did was we took the cells um, and just prepared membranes and then incubated the membranes with the indicated agonist for either 10 minutes or 30 minutes. And either way, these are all matched, Either way, we get an increase in uh, the G protein coupling. So you don't need the whole cell for this. There's not a chance here for an upregulation of the G protein, for example. It's very likely that this is a receptor mediated event um, and doesn't require an intact cell. So here's 17, 18, 14, 9, 6, 8, and these are untransfected CHO cell membranes. So we think this is an event that has to do with the ligand binding to the receptor and promoting an irreversible activation of G-protein coupling. So if we do think it's happening at a non-competitive site, we can test this by doing a classic shield analysis where we know DAMGO and naloxone, for example, are, are competitive agonists. They both bind to the orthosteric site. And so if you do a dose response curve with DAMGO, we can see stimulation. And if we start to include increasing concentrations of naloxone, we shift the dose response curve linearly proportional to the concentration of naloxone included, and we can still reach the maximum response. And so this is a typical shield analysis. It's a linear fit. It confirms a competitive interaction. When we do the shield analysis with 1718, well, it starts out as a partial agonist, as I've mentioned. And so as we start to shift, we start losing the ability to get to the top, but we're not sure if that's because, well, it's precipitating, we can't go higher in our, in our concentrations of 1718. So if we could go higher, would it get to the top? So this was rather inconclusive. But we do have our full agonist, 14968. And when we do that in combination with increasing concentrations of naloxone, we do tend to get a linear shift in the potency, but we see a drop in the maximum stimulation with 14968. And this is a hallmark of a non-competitive interaction. So this um, observation really supports that 14968 and likely 1718 are acting non-competitively non at more and likely binding to a different site on the receptor than the um, orthosteric site. Now, when we first did these experiments and characterized these ligands, we thought they were orthosteric ligands. We had done radio ligand binding using tritiated DAMGO. We saw no indication based on these curves that there was anything more than a competitive interaction, and we didn't really pursue uh, much after this. You can see these are all the ones we reported in the cell paper uh, quite some time ago, and it's a beautiful dis full displacement of DAMGO binding. Um, however, uh, we then, with our shield analysis, said so we need to look at other uh, radio ligands because perhaps we have probe dependence here. We can't see the allosteric effect or the non-competitive effect. And so we moved to tritiated diprenorphine binding. Uh, these are, this is fentanyl and the uh, non-biased or the beta restin bias ligand 11501, uh, uh, sufentanyl, lacerdine are all competing with uh, diprenorphine. But you get into the G-protein bias agonist and you can see they are very clearly, these were the partials, 
clearly um, non-competitive with diprenorphine, and also 14968, the full agonist, also non-competitive with diprenorphine. Uh, we can also see this for 14968 and 1718 um, with using tritiated naloxone. So again, additional information uh, supporting that these are non-competitive agonists. So is this relevant in brain? So we looked um, in the mouse brainstem doing G-protein coupling, and we know that traditionally for a partial agonist, when you include a partial agonist alongside of a full agonist, you can reverse the effects of the full agonist. So here's a classic example. Sufentanil, like fentanyl, acts as a partial agonist in the brainstem. And when you take a dose of DAMGO here and start adding increasing concentrations of sufentanil, you displace the DAMGO and you lead to only seeing the signaling induced by sufentanil. So this is a competition with DAMGO. Uh, you can see this for 11501. We can compete with DAMGO stimulation down to the level that 11501 stimulates. And oloceridine is a very potent agonist, um, but it gives a very low window in the brainstem. So it's very difficult to see the induced coupling uh, above the background. However, you can see that it acts as a traditional partial agonist and it can displace DAMGO and uh, you end up with the coupling that would be stimulated by oloceridine alone. So very classic competitive partial agonists. This is now looking down here, 15099 and 1718. These are the biased agonists. Here's DAMGO, here's in competition. There's no displacement, even though they're clearly partial agonists for promoting G-protein coupling in the brainstem. We see this also for 1718, where we again, do not compete with DAMGO's ability to activate the receptor, and uh, even though it is a partial. And we think the 1718 and 14968 are acting at the same site because here's 14968, a full agonist, and we can compete with its ability to stimulate the receptor by increasing concentrations of um, 14 or 1718. So this is, um, I think, pretty exciting that we have a non-competitive agonist can bind to a different site than the orthosteric agonist and still permit the orthosteric agonist to signal. So DAMGO here, the encephalin, can still function. Okay, a control, none of the compounds do anything in the um, mu opioid receptor knockout brainstem. Okay, so we propose that 1718 or 14968 are non-competitive agonists at more, and they may be nearly irreversible for their ability to stimulate GTP gamma S binding to G proteins. And so what would this mean for in vivo use? So I turn back to 14968, because 1718 produces very little respiratory suppression, but 14968, although it has a wider therapeutic window than, than uh, fentanyl, still produces significant respiratory um, uh, suppression. And so the question is, if it's an irreversible agonist and a full agonist, would this respiratory suppression still be sensitive to naloxone? And so I've shown you that the SR bound compound or receptor can still be antagonized by naloxone in vitro. And so the question is, would this work in vivo? So we're going to compare this dose of fentanyl and this dose of um, SR14968 because they produce the same effect. So this is one mg per kg, and that's 10 mg per kg. And so this is in mice, and um, this is one mg per kg of fentanyl, and we we reversed it at 15 minutes because of the rapid onset and rapid um, action and uh, fast PK of fentanyl. And so we reversed it with five mg per kg of naloxone because it's been reported it takes upward of three to 10 mg per kg of naloxone to reverse the effects of fentanyl. Um, and you can see we can reverse the respiratory suppression. This is O2, they decrease breathing and it's rescued. So down here, we've taken that 10 mg per kg dose of 14968. We give it 30 minutes because this takes longer to get into the brain, has a slower PK. So we wanted to make sure we got to peak. And then we can reverse it with just 0.5 mg per kg of naloxone. So now by having the agonist acting at a different site than naloxone, the receptor still has availability for naloxone to bind and can still reverse uh, the effects of 14968 in vivo. So we think that's kind of cool. Um, I'm just gonna summarize that these compounds appear to be non-competitive, um, more agonists that may bind irreversibly to more. We don't know for sure that they bind irreversibly. They may have some sort of uh, membrane partitioning. Uh, we're still trying to work that out. 
Um, the responses to the non-competitive agonists are reversible with naloxone. And um, all of the ones that we've tested so far that we've reported on have this uh, same effect if they are indeed beta rest and bias um, against a uh, G protein biased. And then while the beta rest and bias ligand that we tested doesn't have this property, we don't know if that's part of why, but we hypothesize that perhaps the stabilization of the receptor in this manner that promotes this constitutive G protein binding uh, may prevent the beta rest and recruitment in the cellular studies. And this may, what for whatever reason, whatever it does in vivo, may prevent some of the tolerance uh, development, whether that's beta restin dependent or not. So I will end and welcome questions. Um, this is my lab before. Some of these uh, good people have gone on to jobs that pay well. Um, but I want to just highlight uh, a lot of the work that I've shown you here, especially the respiratory studies and the brain coupling studies were done by Agnes. Um, Afani has really, and Agnes have worked really hard to do all those really long-term uh, pain studies by twice daily, every 12 hours, oral gavage. It's quite a challenge. Uh, Nicole Kennedy and Tom Bannister, who make the compounds uh, in collaboration with our lab. And uh, Ed, who's uh, worked out really all of this uh, biochemistry along with Kai, uh, looking at the chronic treatments and um, the cellular studies uh, and so forth. So I will, um, and of course, thank you, Nida, for, for funding our, our research efforts. Thanks, Laura. Um, we're out of time, <laughs> and a little bit over time. Um, there are some uh, interesting questions in the Q&A. Can you see those, Laura? Yeah, I can answer them as we are right. introducing the next. Right. So the next is me. Um, oh, okay. I can introduce you, Brian. You don't need to introduce me. Oh, That's okay. Fine. <laughs> um, I just need to share my screen here. Um, before I start, though, somebody, some anonymous person has, has asked the question multiple times, how how a biochemist knows that they have discovered something definitive, I guess, or the truth. And um, we never, you know, in science, uh, we only disprove hypotheses. So at the end of the day, we're, we're testing a hypothesis. Um, and by definition, a hypothesis is not a theory or a law. So we can only say we tested the hypothesis and we didn't disprove it. So, so if you can quit sharing your screen. Oh yeah, sorry. That's fine. I'm answering questions. Yeah, no, no problem. Okay. Hello everybody, I'm Brian Roth. Thanks for hanging around. Let me close the Q&A here. Um, and I wanna thank ACS uh, Biochemistry for uh, sponsoring this really interesting webinar today. And I'm gonna to present uh, mainly new work okay. on uh, potentially new molecular targets for pain. Uh, all of this work has been funded by this um, initiative by the NIH Illuminating the Druggable Genome. And for those of you who, who are interested, uh, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm very active on Twitter and uh, highlight uh, mainly scientific uh, papers of my interest. So what I'm gonna to do today is I'm gonna um, discuss some very recent uh, data we have with this uh, interesting family of orphan G protein coupled receptors, what are called the MRGPRX receptors. Um, and they get their name because they were originally identified as a primate exclusive family of receptors uh, related to mass, the mass related GPCR. So X means primate exclusive, um, we now know they're not exclusively found in primates, so they're found in dogs and pigs, but, but actually not in rodent, rodent models, so mice and rats. Um, and they're really interesting as potential pain targets because they're expressed in the dorsal root ganglia here, uh, where they mediate uh, sensations of pain and itch from the periphery. And they're also found in many non-neuronal cells, uh, you can see macrophages, mast cells, and lymphocytes, uh, where they're likely involved in regulating uh, inflammatory and neuroinflammatory based pain. Um, what I'm gonna show you today is that they also mediate uh, uh, a number of side effects of medications, uh, in particular, 
uh, opiate induced itch, which which is is actually a side effect uh, uh, experienced by many many people who take opioids. Um, they also likely mediate uh, this interesting granuloma formation, which is uh, seen uh, occasionally in individuals who have indwelling catheters and are uh, being infused uh, opiates uh, uh, chronically for uh, intractable pain. There's increasing evidence that they're involved in neuroinflammatory pain and ulcerative colitis, um, as well as drug-induced stitch. So this is a really, really important family of receptors uh, that, that until recently we knew almost nothing about. And what I'm going to do first is, is just highlight a recent paper uh, that was the work of an extremely talented uh, student of mine, Kate Lansu, and uh, a student of uh, Brian Choiquet's Joel Karpiak, both of whom now have their own uh, research uh, groups in pharma. Kate, Kate's now at uh, Eli Lilly, uh, and I wanted to say hello to Kate. Um, and so what, what we had what we had done uh, starting really many years ago was we were very interested in uh, developing assays in which we could screen uh, intention, essentially the entire druggable genome uh, for G protein coupled receptors in a single or multiple 384 well plates. And so what we did is we developed, um, we sort of stole this Tango assay, which was developed by uh, Richard Axel's lab, Gilead Barnea was the, was the postdoc who now has his own lab who developed it. And it's in theory, it's a very simple assay. Basically, you have a GPCR uh, coding sequence. You put a vasopressin tail on it, which is a very uh, potent receptor for uh, arrestin, a TEV protease site, and then a transcription factor. And when the receptor is activated, a modified arrestin is translocated and liberates the transcription factor, ultimately leading to uh, luminescence. And there are several nice things about this. Um, it's specific to the transfected receptor. It's independent of any uh, G protein signaling. It's scalable, and it's extremely easy to measure. And um, so we we essentially developed this for um, uh, more than 300 GPCRs. The platform is is available through AdGene. And when Kate came to the lab, uh, she was interested in this family of receptors. And she did a relatively straightforward experiment. She screened around 7,000 compounds against all of the MRGPRX family receptors in a parallel fashion, and then validated um, the active spy orthogonal assays, did some SAR, and then uh, synthesize this into new understanding of the receptor. And uh, in the initial screen, um, these, these were the results that, that we got. MRGPRX3, we actually found no actives for that, that particular receptor, but the other three members of the family, we were able to find actives. And in general, um, they had a unique uh, chemistry associated with their actives, although some, some were shared, as you can see. Um, and at the time, uh, it was thought that these receptors are G-alpha Q coupled specifically. Um, there were no selective small molecule ligands known. Their role in sensory neurons was, was entirely unknown, but, they, but MRGPRX2 was noted to induce degranulation in mast cells, which could be responsible for some of, some of its activities. And what we found, uh, or what Kate found very interestingly, was that there were a large number of opiate and opioid-like molecules that activated MRGPRX2. And these came from a variety of scaffolds. We had um, basically uh, sort of standard morphinance scaffolds, as well as these novel scaffolds um, for uh, non-morphinan-based uh, uh, opioids, so TAN67 and this ADL compound. Um, she screened a huge number of uh, of opioids that and non-opioid uh, uh, or morphinan and non-morphinan based opioid agonists and antagonists that we're able to get from the NIDA drug supply. And what she found was that uh, all of the active ligands actually shared a very similar pharmacophore of um, 
basically uh, a basic nitrogen with a single amino group attached to it, whereas the inactive compounds all had uh, really a more bulky group, or in some cases, no attachment at all to this uh, basic nitrogen. And the fact that there was this very steep SAR uh, at MRGPRX2 convinced us that this was likely uh, mediated by a specific uh, interaction with the receptor. And um, we then used this information to uh, prosecute a large computational screen, or Joel Karpiak in Brian Choquette's lab did, to determine if we could, since, since none of these compounds are selective for MRGPRX2, if we could, if we could use them as, as probes to build a model, which ultimately could be prosecuted where, by a very large scale docking campaign to ultimately find selective chemical tools. And at the time, there were no structures of any of these receptors or, or even receptors that were similar to them. So we lined them to the, to the kappa opiate receptor. And then a large number of molecular models were made. Um, and then COP, we now had this large library of compounds that we knew interacted with the receptor. And we could use them to validate uh, various models of receptor uh, interaction. Uh, ultimately, this led to the identification of particular amino acids uh, in the binding site. You can see here that the binding site was predicted to be relatively superficially in the receptor. Um, and I'll show you uh, later, this turned out to be true. Six million compounds were docked. Um, and ultimately, we were able to discover a probe pair uh, for MRGPRX2 which was active not only at uh, MRGPRX2 receptors expressed in hex cells, but also MRGPRX2 receptors expressed in uh, human mast cell line lab two cells. And subsequently, these, uh, these results have been uh, replicated and expanded by many, many, many investigators uh, and teams of investigators. Well, as I mentioned there, at the time there was some, some debate uh, actually rather heated debate about which particular G proteins uh, the MRGPRX2 family uh, interacted with. And um, recently we, we decided to re, uh, uh, re, re investigate this, this question. And we took advantage of uh, a recent uh, platform that uh, has come out of my lab by uh, Reed Olson and Jeff DeBerto, which was published in Nature Chemical Biology last year, where we developed sensors for essentially all the G-alpha and uh, beta and gamma subunits. Uh, and this was done by an iterative uh, structure-guided design uh, approach um, using bioluminescence resonance energy transfer, and then uh, a screen, ultimately a screen to, to find an ult op optimized uh, heterotrimeric biosensor for essentially every G alpha, beta, gamma uh, subunit combination. And again, this is available through Abgene uh, and was published uh, last year. And what we found actually to our surprise um, was that uh, MRGPRX2, this, this very interesting and important receptor, uh, really couples to all family, uh, all G alpha subunit families, uh, although with some, some variation depending on the ligand. So it, it couples strongly to, to G alpha I, G alpha S, G alpha Q, and the G, G12 and, and G13 family receptors, so, or G protein. So it appears to be a very promiscuous receptor. So this, uh, this is in a paper uh, which is currently uh, revised for publication. Um, ultimately, of course, uh, because MRGPRX2 when it's activated, it appears to be um, involved in pain, neuropathic pain and itch, as well as other types of painful sensations. Uh, we realized that what we you know, ultimately needed, needed for therapeutics are, are selective antagonists for MRGPRX2. And so these were developed, identified and developed by, by Isa Singh from Brian Choiket's lab, Hygen, Kang and Chan from my lab. And uh, we, were able, we were able to show that these compounds uh, potently inhibit uh, MRGPRX2 activation in hex cells. 
They do the same thing in LAD2 cells. They appear to be potent inverse agonists in that they have activity on their own, they have, and they have essentially no off-target action. So when the paper is, is published, uh, these compounds will be available from Sigma Chemical Company as, uh, as a probe pair for this uh, very important receptor. Um, ultimately, though, what, what, we, what we hope to do is uh, do, uh, solve the structure of this family of receptors. And then once the structure is known, uh, utilize these really amazing computational resources we have in collaboration with the Choiquet Lab to prosecute very large scale docking campaigns to identify new chemical matter for these receptors. And this was a project that was undertaken by this extremely talented uh, postdoc of mine, Chan, and Jonathan Fay here at UNC in the Department of Biochemistry. And here you can see them uh, making grids uh, during the COVID shutdown. Um, and the one structure I'll show you today is uh, MRGPRX4. Um, this was solved by CryoEM. Uh, this is a, uh, a single image from a grid. Um, you could, for those of you that do CryoEM or are conversant with CryoEM, each of these is a single particle. This is nearly a perfect uh, sample for CryoEM. This is the 2D classification. And already you can see in the 2D classification uh, structural details of the receptor in, in complex with, uh, in this case, um, uh, G alpha Q and, um, and this, uh, this compound uh, CZ, uh, which we have recently identified as a selective agonist of MRGPRX4. And you can see that we're able to get a resolution of 2.6 angstroms, which for even for X-ray of a GPSR would be fantastic and is, is really outstanding for cryo-EM. So because the structure was at such high resolution, we were able to map or to model essentially all the side chains in the receptor and the heterotrimeric G protein, and as well as the ligand with a very high degree of uh, certainty. Um, this particular receptor, MRGPRX2, X4 is interesting uh, because it, it appears to, uh, at one of its functions, appears to mediate uh, itch from bile acids and uh, also uh, mediates uh, itch from uh, negatively charged drugs that are used uh, as uh, treatments for uh, diabetes, so drugs like metaglinide, metaglinide, and so on. And when we solved the structure, it was immediately clear why this particular receptor binds these negatively charged drugs, because it has this huge uh, positively charged well here, right at the uh, extracellular surface, which facilitates binding of, of the negatively charged moieties in bile acids and other drugs. Um, this is just a little movie I made of the receptor. There you can see this, this new compound that we made, uh, how it fits in fits into the receptor very nicely here. Um, you can see that it's coordinated by um, both positive charge as well as uh, uh, hydrogen bond type interactions. Really nice um, visualization of G protein interactions. Of course, uh, the receptor interacts with the G protein through this alpha five helix, but as well, there is uh, really uh, important, there are really important interactions here between uh, intracellular loop two and the alpha helical domain, uh, which is specific for G alpha Q. This is now an interaction we've seen in probably a dozen G alpha Q coupled receptors and others, others as well. So we think this is a, a hallmark for specificity. Uh, nice lipid, you can see this nice lipid binding site there as well. And then um, here is, is the ligand bound uh, very nicely uh, in the receptor. So just, uh, just a beautiful piece of work. Um, and Avi has, has, uh, has introduced um, AlphaFold as a, as a potential resource for um, identifying structures of druggable targets that, that may be important for treating pain and other conditions. 
And uh, as we were revising this paper, the Alpha Fold and the Rosetta Fold papers both came out and both provided uh, predicted structures for uh, MRGPRX4 and many, many other, really all GPCRs in the genome. And we took advantage of this to, uh, to determine really how useful the alpha fold structure prediction might be. So here we have a electrostatic map of MRGPRX4. And what I'm gonna do is, is show you how it, it differs from the map uh, developed by alpha fold. So you can see it here. We're gonna go to the, to the binding side. You can see this really pos large positive uh, pocket here, which is a key feature of that, of the structure. And next we'll see alpha fold. You can see it actually has the electrostatic map backwards. So it actually predicts a completely different binding pocket as well as overall electrostatic makeup. And here you can see the structure versus the alpha fold predictions here. Um, the structure here is in, um, is in silver. The prediction here is in blue. And you can see, although some of the residues are are oriented properly. A number of them are really are, uh, are predicted to be in entirely different orientations. Um, and when we looked at about 20 unpublished structures that we have and compared them to both alpha fold and rosetta fold, we found that only in about half of the structures were the, was the alpha fold prediction close. The rosetta fold predictions were not, not particularly close for, for most of them. Um, indicating that, that perhaps it might be useful in half of the cases. The problem we have though is it's, it was impossible to uh, predict a priori which model would be correct uh, and which would, which would not be correct. Um, so the take home message here is that uh, we and other labs have developed many technologies which can accelerate drug discovery for pain related targets. Uh, this includes the Presto Tango resource uh, which allows you to screen the entire druggable GPCR ohm in a single plate. The TruePath platform, which allows one to screen all the transducers. Uh, and then uh, also this ultra large scale docking that was developed uh, by the Shortcut and Irwin lab. And all of these have been published. Uh, finally, uh, I just wanna mention uh, a new technology we have developed, which is uh, a very uh, facile approach for directed molecular evolution in mammalian cells. This was principally the work of Justin English in my lab. I just want to mention that everything uh, that, I, that I showed you today is open source. All the plasmids are available through AdGene, uh, and to date they have executed more than 31,000 orders. I want to give a shout out to the people that, that were involved in this particular work. Kate, uh, now at Eli Lilly and Reed, now at Accentia, really driving um, the MRGPRX2 and TruePath work. Hi, Jen and Chan, uh, more recently with the structural studies and Jeff uh, with TruePath. From Brian Schoiket's lab, Joel, uh, Isha, and Brian Bender have been key to this particular work. John Jen's lab um, developed a number of uh, the small molecules that we have described. And Jonathan Fay, our, our collaborator in the UNC Department of Biochemistry, uh, basically did the cryo EM and made the maps, which, which were important for solving the structures. And I want to thank um, National Institute of Drug Abuse, the Druggable Genome Initiative, and IMH, as well as DARPA for funding this work today. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to answer uh, any questions you may have. Thank you. Or if we have questions for others as well. Okay, so let's go and look at the messages here. Somebody says, please check the stereochemistry of Sonomini. Yeah, I probably have it wrong. I'm sorry. I got it. I downloaded it, downloaded the structure from uh, Camp Draw, and sometimes they don't get the stereochemistry correct. Um, question from Kate. Did any of the MRGPRX4 binding site residues reveal any key differences 
between MRGPRX receptors that suggest some of the chemical subtype selectivity? Yes. So MRGPRX4, uh, the key binding site residues are positively charged, they're asparagines, whereas with MRGPRX2, they're aspartic acid. So there's this complete flipping of the, of the electrostatic. Um, and, um, and because of this, uh, MRGPRX2 binds actually positively charged ligands and MRGPRX4 binds uh, negatively charged ligands. Christina Muller, do you think MRGPRB2 is a mouth, mouse ortholog of MRGPRX2? It's prob so it's probably one of several ortholog-like receptors. Um, so in mice and rats, the MRGPR family has undergone this extreme diversification. Uh, in, in, man, in humans, uh, there are only four members. In, in mice, I don't know what, there are 20 or so different members. And uh, MRGPR B2 is one of those that is similar uh, in function uh, and um, in pharmacology, but not, not identical to MRGPRX2, sadly. Um, and I think, I think what, what a number of investigators now are doing is they're, they're, they have made humanized uh, MRGPRX2 mice where they have knocked the human MRGPRX2 into the, into the mouse MRGPRB2 locus so that it now is more human-like. Um, Istvan, do you have any experience with uh, two benzyl benzimidol such as etonitazine? I don't. And Kate, do you? I don't know if Kate's there. You can answer in the Q and A if if those if any of the if you remember if any of those were hits in your screen. Um, Okay, so that's it. Are there any, uh, no more questions? I think I answered all the questions. Lakshmi, you have a question? Yeah, I have a couple of questions I wrote in the chat. Can you com comment on endogenous ligands for these? My other question yes. had to do with, do the endogenous ligands interact with each other, you think? So uh, for MRGPRX2, there are a number of endogenous ligands. Uh, mainly peptides, so cortostatin. Dynorphin actually isn't, is, has reasonable affinity. Dynorphin A and dynorphin B have reasonable affinity. Um, and, uh, and, other, and BAM, 8 to 22, binds to MRGPRX, activates MRGPRX1. Bile acids are endogenous ligands for MRGPRX4. Um, so for X2, it looks like uh, peptides that have a basic motif uh, it, it appears from the structure that they have a lysine or an arginine, which, which uh, interacts with the aspartic acids. That's, that's key for, for activating them. Um, we, don't, we don't know that, I think the, the question is, even though there are a number of peptides that, that actually activate it pretty potently um, in the nanomolar range, arrange, whether, they're, whether they are the endogenous ligand for the receptor or whether this is just sort of a scavenger receptor. That's, these are, those are questions we don't know. Um, and, uh, you know, but, but a really interesting question, so. Okay. I have another question about resources. Sure. Um, are there any good uh, program to dock peptides into ah. ligands? No. Well, there are some out there. I don't know if they're good or not. Um, what, what some people have been doing is using alpha fold. So they've been connecting the, uh, the ligand by um, adding the amino acids to, to the amino terminus. And um, I've heard that they've gotten some pretty good predictions, but I'll, I'll leave that to you to try for yourself. Yeah. Um, but I have gotten some, um, uh, some people who have told me that that, that appears to work. And in, in cases where they actually know the structure, it appeared to be sort of similar. So.
All right. So I think that's it. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, anything from ACS before we go? Um, yeah, just another huge thank you um, to you, Brian, for working with us to organize the event, to Laura, Lakshmi, Avi for giving fantastic talks, um, and to the audience for joining us today. So if you want to read more about research on the topic, we have a great special issue recently published in biochemistry. Um, um, registered attendees will also be receiving a recording via email, so if you were not able to stay for the whole time or want to watch everything again, uh, that will be available. And um, thanks, and I look forward to seeing you at another ACS event soon.